Hello, this is James from the DSO Imager channel. Tonight I'm going to do a review of the Celestron AVX. So we'll start an intro uh, to this review. I'll talk about my history and experience with the mount. Then we'll do a quick walk around the mount showing the different features that it has. Uh, then I'll cover how the mount performs when using it for a visual. And then I'll also go over planetary lunar imaging uh, and deep sky astrophotography and then um, end up with my final thoughts and maybe look at some uh, uh, compar comparable products. Now I first purchased this mount way back in 2017. It was around springtime 2017 and uh, yeah, like many people that have bought the AVX you're just starting out in astrophotography and you have a limited budget and this mount seemed to fit. Uh, back then the big thing was making sure that I picked an equatorial mount. I mean I was very green and I did a lot of research but I didn't want to spend a lot of money so I wanted I knew at, the, at that time that I wanted a equatorial mount that had go-to functionality. The AVX uh, comes in a bunch of different packages. I got the cheapest package that came with a uh, six inch uh, Newtonian scope and um, it's not actually a very good scope. <laughs> but the price of the mount alone versus the price of the mount with that telescope back in 2017, the difference was $100. And prior to that telescope, I had a uh, Orion ST80, so an 80 millimeter acro mat, and that wasn't really a great scope for imaging either. So despite it not being a really good telescope, uh, it was still an upgrade. And of course, I was running that Orion ST80 on a non-go-to mount. I had a CG4 mount that had the clock drives on it. So my thinking was the go-to would help me find targets because at the time trying to center a target with a non-go-to mount was very uh, challenging uh, especially with targets that were dim and um, I also knew that I needed to get dither uh, something that was capable of running a dither so I knew that guiding was uh, something that I needed to add and I couldn't get that done with the CG4 without uh, buying extra parts for it all right, so let's step outside and take a look at this mount. All right, let's take a quick look at the Celestron AVX. All right, so right here you got the declination clutch. And the RA clutch is right here. The counterweight shaft comes off, so it just screws in right up over here. Here's our Alt-As adjustments. This is the lock for the altitude and here's the adjustment on the back. Polar scope goes in here. Now they don't come with a polar scope but this polar scope itself is available. Not getting a good angle on the light, but you can see it there. It's just a typical polar scope. To be able to use the polar scope, there's a cover right here, and uh, you have to remove the cover. And notice that the shaft is in the way, so you have to rotate the deck. And now you can see uh, through that polar scope. Now we've come around to the other side. This is where you have the different various ports. So there is a auto guiding port right here, but no one really uses this, right? This is if you're using that ST cable, uh, but you really shouldn't be using that. Uh, this port right over there, that's for the hand controller. And then we have two auxiliary ports right here. So if you had something like a Star Sense or the, or the Celestron GPS, locator or one of those types of devices they would connect into these aux ports. Here's our hand controller and at the bottom of the hand controller there's the USB port. So in order to configure this for astrophotography I have that 
USB port connected to my mini PC. Now, first I do want to make clear, I am 99.9% .9 astrophotographer. I do very little uh, visual astronomy, although I'm planning to uh, do that more. So I just wanted to say that to, to recognize that I am still pretty much, uh, I would say, maybe not a total newbie, but I'm definitely not, um, not an experienced uh, viewer. That said, I've run four different scopes on this mount, the biggest one being that 8-inch edge, which you see here, pictured here, and it works great visually. The um, calibration on the hand controller is not difficult. Uh, the hardest part is getting the, the first two calibration stars lined up. Uh, but once you get those lined up and you add those four reference stars, I found the uh, accuracy of the go-tos to be extremely good. And it handles that 8 inch edge with no problem at all. I've gotten some fantastic views with, the, um, uh, with Jupiter and Saturn uh, using this scope. Now, I've even set this scope up out on my driveway a couple years ago for Halloween, and I let the kids and uh, the parents look at both Saturn and Jupiter, and that was a big hit. So the mount works perfectly uh, for that type of environment. Now, I also have Celestron Star Sense. Now, Star Sense, I think, is like a brand name, and they've got a lot of different products that utilizes uh, this Star Sense technology. The Star Sense that I had, that I purchased back in 2017, uh, you would put it where the finder scope would go, and it had its own little computer, and it had it connected to that auxiliary port that I mentioned in the walk around, and it would basically do plate solving, uh, and you could use that to center target. So with the Star Sense, you wouldn't even have to bother doing the star calibration and uh, it works wonderfully. Now that said, I, I picked, picked up the Star Sense again way back in 2017 because I wanted to have something that was easier at the time to locate targets and this is before I was uh, utilizing the plate solve functionality in my capture software. So once I got plate, solve, uh, plate solving working, uh, there was no reason for star sense from a astrophotography perspective. But I still think it's really good for, um, for visual and for star parties. Now for solar system astrophotography, astrophotography so this is like the uh, planets, the moon, uh, the sun, which you see here, I'm capturing uh, pictures of the sun. Uh, this is also a solid mount for that. Now, I don't do uh, a whole lot of this type of astrophotography. I'm primarily a deep sky astrophotography, but I've been able to get good pictures. The mount tracks well enough for recording video, and uh, it, it handled everything just fine. Uh, one example, uh, the main camera that I use for uh, capturing planets is an ASI-178 Mono. So that ASI-178, it's like a 6, a 6 megapixel camera, but at small pixels like 2 point something microns. So it's a relatively tight field of view. Uh, so one night I got one of the planets, I can't remember which one, it was either Saturn or Jupiter, I think it was probably Saturn. Saturn was still pretty low in the horizon and I got it framed up and uh, I wanted to wait until Saturn reached the peak of its uh, altitude, which was oh, probably two or three hours away. So I s left everything set up and then I just went inside the house for a couple of hours. And uh, I came back out and Saturn was still in the field of view. I mean, it drifted a little bit. Uh, and honestly, that's probably due to uh, a minor polar alignment error. But it was pretty cool that uh, the AVX was able to keep the uh, plan planet in that tiny field of view uh, for hours without any adjustments or anything anything like that. All right, now how about deep sky astrophotography? Here things get a little bit more mixed, shall we say. So the mount is very lightweight, it's very portable. Um, in the early days when I was running in that say, 80 millimeter scope and then shortly after getting the mount with that six uh, inch new Newtonian, I picked up a 70 millimeter triplet. And so 
I could pick up the whole rig, counterweight and everything, and, and manipulate it. So pretty lightweight, uh, inexpensive, which is probably one of the main reasons people, including myself, opted for an AVX. It is a robust mount. I've had it, again, since 2017, so what, we're pushing six plus years now, and the mount's been, um, no, I mean, no, no physical, mechanical problems with the mount. The mount's been solid. It's even been rained on a couple of times, and it's spent the entire uh, uh, triple-digit uh, summer under a cover in the backyard, and it's uh, held up pretty well. The uh, AVX comes with a great tripod. It is a very sturdy tripod. It's kind of funny seeing uh, a lot of people uh, with AM5s, ZWO AM5s, now looking for Celestron uh, AVX tripods. Uh, documentation that's out there for the uh, AVX is excellent documentation. Very good uh, to read that. Uh, to understand how um, all the different functions and features that you have uh, available for the AVX, including the ability to polar align even though you don't have uh, a direct view of Polaris. That is something that I utilized uh, many times because I was setting up in the front yard of my house and I did not have a view of Polaris. Recently, uh, Celestron came out with uh, CPWI software. This is a software that you can use to control the mount. It's got full planetarium functionality. It's got uh, more objects than the hand controller does. Uh, so it's pretty nifty software. And uh, there's also a large user base of AVXs out there. Lots of people have used them. So if you're needing help with different things, you'll find a bunch of forum posts on it. And if you ask questions, chances are you're going to find people that have experience and have gone through what, with whatever your question is related to. Now, uh, some of the negatives here. Uh, the most important thing is that the guiding is inconsistent. Uh, we'll go over this some more uh, in the next uh, section here. Uh, we'll look at some PhD logs and so I can show you exactly what it's like. But uh, it's it's just it, it is it can be very frustrating and we're not even talking about uh, sensitivity to like the the weather or the scene conditions. Uh, you can have a night that's perfectly fine, perf perfectly good seeing and it'll start off really well and then it'll run really terrible and then it'll run really well again. It's <laughs> it's really weird. And and I'm running, by the way, most nights I'm running three astrophotography rigs at the same time. I have this AVX that's currently using a, a ASCAR 65 PHQ. And I have two EQ6Rs, one with uh, that 8-inch edge and another one with a 115-millimeter refractor. So... If it's like bad seeing, then all three mounts are doing terrible, and it's it's obvious that we're we're dealing with either seeing or wind or something like that. Uh, but on nice clear nights where the other two mounts are just humming along, and the AVX is going from solid guiding to terrible guiding, it's just you know it's just the AVX. Meridian flips. That's another problem that I've had, or it's another issue that I have problems with on this AVX. And it's, again, inconsistent. Some nights, it does the meridian flip just fine. No problems at all. Uh, other nights, it, uh, it, it struggles. And what I mean by struggle or getting lost, I've seen it where it'll execute the meridian flip. It'll flip it over. It will get about 4,000 pixels from the object. And then it flips back over to the other side again. And it'll go east, west, east, west, almost like it's looking for it. So it seems that when the object is at the zenith, the mount just has a really hard time uh, uh, figuring out exactly where the target is, even though the plate solving is telling it where it needs to go. So w some ways that I've had to mitigate this is, fortunately, I'm running a small scope, and I've, had the, I've configured my capture software, which I'm using Sequence Generator Pro, I, I tell it not to execute the meridian flip until like 10 or 12 minutes after the meridian flip. I have enough clearance, so there's no there's no collision with the uh, scope. And usually that it's it's like the object's got to get 
far enough past the zenith in order for the mount to reach it. I don't know. It's really weird. And sometimes if it gets lost, even after waiting 10 or 12 minutes, it'll just end up pointing down towards the ground on the uh, east side. It just makes no sense. Uh, it's like, is there, a, is there a setting in the telescope where it thinks it's in the wrong hemisphere or something like that? And if that was the case, why is it inconsistent? Why does it work sometimes and other times it doesn't work? So it's really, uh, you know, quite frankly, for an imaging rig, that's, that's an unacceptable problem to have. If anyone else that has an AVX and is watching this and has encountered this problem and has resolved the issue, let me know because I'm really curious if there's a setting that I'm missing or something that can help this. Uh, let's see, next, polar alignment adjustments. It, they're a bit fiddly. It's just you have to be really light touched with the, uh, with the uh, azimuth controls because it's easy to overshoot. And then I showed in the walk around the way that uh, the altitude works. If you are adjusting the back screw and you get it just right, and then you tighten down the front, it's going to be off. And so you kind of have to overshoot by, by uh, a degree or two and then tighten it down enough until it's on, on the mark. It's, it's just, I mean, it's not hard. <laughs> Uh, and, and after you've done it a few times, you kind of get a feel for how to dial it in correctly. But it's just, you know, it's there. It's, it's more difficult or more fiddly uh, than my two EQ6s to get dialed in. Now, I also have CPWI software as a con. Uh, and the reason for it is that it's got a lot of great features and everything on it. But for the type of imaging that I do with deep sky imaging, it's, I don't need any of those features. We're using plate solving to line up on targets. And, um, you know, I, so, so an object database isn't important. I'm not sitting there clicking on specific objects on the map to make the mount slew over to these targets because all this is handled by the uh, image acqu acquisition software. And I know EQ mods are old, and I know that some people are knock it for being old software, and it doesn't look the the graphical user interface doesn't look modern. But I mean, it works, <laughs> and it's got some nice features to it. Uh, so I mean, I feel like the software that we use to allow the computer and allow the acquisition software to talk to the mount should be very lightweight does what it needs to do and then gets out of the way like I don't need any of these extra features so uh, sometimes I feel like it's it's just it's it's I don't want to call it bloatware because it does look like it's cool software but you know it's just not needed for deep sky imaging and then if uh, if I'm out at a star party or whatever you know I don't want to have a computer connected to the mount and then point the computer looking at a monitor screen and pointing the computer. I mean, the, the, the hand controller, while it's not, it's not a modern hand controller and it's got a very old school LCD uh, panel on it, it actually works. <laughs> and I mean, we're looking, we're looking through the eyepiece in that scenario, not at the hand controller. So, you know, I mean, again, I think it's, it, it just feels a little misplaced. All right, uh, this next bullet, I, actually, it looks like it's a typo because I have no mount limits. I would say the no mount limits is really related to the EQ mod, the CPWI software, and probably a limitation of the mount. So you can't set mount limits uh, with an AVX. With my two EQ6s, I can set mount limits. So that, that prevents a collision of, the, uh, of your optics and the, um, and the pier or a tripod. Now, speaking of PhD for guiding, uh, just some some of the, these bullet points are the experience that I've gained using the AVX. So there's a lot of conventional wisdom about settings that work well in PhD, but they really don't apply to the AVX. Uh, so you need to use really short exposures. We're talking one second, half a second exposures. The AVX is so inconsistent in its uh, in its tracking 
that it's funny I said it was good before but for what we need the, the amount of precision that we need in deep sky astrophotography it's very inconsistent and if you let it go for two three four second exposures it's just gonna get way way too far off the the mark so you have have to keep it uh, very short exposures and the histories option which is often cited as a means say increase your histories to help smooth out the uh, the tracking uh, no that makes it worse with the AVX and again I think it's because of the way the AVX is is built I mean it was it was built for visual it was not built for astrophotography and again the precision of the mechanics is just not there so it's too it's too random I think for histories to do any good so I pull that way back I think I usually have it set to about five on the AVX maybe less uh, you gotta use high aggressive settings and uh, dithering. We'll 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 look at that in the uh, PhD logs. But uh, I have my uh, capture software set to allow 12 seconds of settle time after a dither. Right? Think about that. 12 seconds. That's a lot. That's actually a lot. That is a lot of overhead, uh, in time wise, uh, to let this uh, to get the best out of this. And recommend short exposures. So I, I, yeah, I have short exposures twice. So the first short exposure, I'm talking about the exposures in PhD. The second is for your image capturing. You definitely want to go with shorter exposures. And what I mean by that is that for narrow band, for example, I'll go 10 minute subs. In my environment with my Bortle skies and my scopes, 10 minute subs uh, with narrow band work well in most situations. With the AVX, I keep it at 450 second subs. Uh, I, I can do 10 minute subs. If, if the AVX is behaving and uh, it'll, it'll run okay with 10 second subs, but the problem is that inconsistency again, and the end result is I would be tossing out too many subs. And if you're at like eight minutes in a 10 minute sub, and then the mount goes nuts for a second, you know, that whole sub gets tossed. That's uh, Again, that is some high overhead on, on your imaging time. And uh, potential hobby killer. That is uh, pretty bold, and I put it in red there. So we'll discuss that a little bit more. All right, potential hobby killer. So why do I say this? Uh, now, now, again, I'm speaking specifically with uh, concerning deep sky astrophotography. So this hobby is a challenge all by itself. It's gotten easier over the past couple of years, but it's still a challenge. If you're building a traditional astrophotography rig with the equatorial mount, you know, you have your, you have your telescope, you have your autofocuser, you got your filter wheel, you're worried about uh, plate solving, PhD guiding, you know, you're working the, uh, the, the exposure length, the gain settings, you're, you're keeping track of all of these different things. You don't need to be out there under the dark losing time fiddling with a mount that's just not behaving. And I can tell you, because I learned astrophotography with an AVX, it is not a good mount to learn on because it's th there were some nights where I spent in my backyard two hours, three hours, not even getting a single exposure, fighting all kinds of things. Either the plate solving wasn't working right, it kept trying to uh, move to a certain target and it would be like 2,000 pixels off and it would keep trying to recenter and the the it would stay 2,000 pixels off very frustrating problem I never really truly figured out how to resolve it it just somehow sometimes resolved itself or switched to a different target or shut everything down power it off turn it back on then it worked I mean this is all very frustrating things to do when you're sitting under a clear dark sky and uh, yeah it was a there was some pain involved it's easier for me to work them out now because I've got a few years of experience but you know again if you're trying to learn astrophotography with one of these classic deep sky rigs uh, this this doesn't help now astrophotography is supposed to be fun and if you're getting frustrated because the mount's not cooperating with you, then this has the potential to completely kill the hobby. So, 
you know, again, it's, it's, uh, it's a problem. Uh, the other thing, do you enjoy tinkering? I put that on there because, you know, there are some people, that's the challenge that they enjoy. They, there is a challenge. There's something to be said about taking a piece of equipment that is inexpensive, isn't known to work very well, and tinkering with it and modding it and doing things to make it work better. And some people enjoy that thing, that sort of thing. I know there are people that have taken AVXs apart and they've re-greased them and they've changed out some of the bearings and other parts in there. And if that's something that interests you, then maybe the AVX uh, is uh, an option to consider. But to be honest, for myself, I want to get pictures. I don't want to be tinkering with the gear. All right, uh, let's look at some PhD guiding logs. All right, so this is, uh, what do we got here? About six hours. <laughs> so this is, uh, this is a pretty good uh, example. And this is an example of when things are good for the AVX. So here's our total RMS, 1.17 arc seconds and I consider this a good night here now I have seen the AVX guide better than this I've seen the AVX guide all the way down into the fives but it never stayed there <laughs> it, it, it may run in the fives for 30 minutes and then the next 30 minutes you're pushing two. so, <laughs> uh, so anyway I would definitely consider 1.17 uh, a good night and you can see here on the chart uh, these gray spots are where the dithers happen and notice how long the dithers are in some cases uh, you can see this sort of thing with the deck it does that uh, and we'll just kind of scroll through yeah so sometimes it has trouble recovering after uh, the dither I mean, overall, not too bad. I mean, this was a pretty good night. If it could do this consistently, I mean, yeah, look at this. Look at this stuff with the with the deck here. Right? It wasn't doing it back here. Well, there it was some, not here. Right? So, I mean, this is the kind of the inconsistency that I'm talking about. It seems to be very sensitive to where the object is in the sky. It always guided better on objects in the north pointed north. Pointed south, it struggled more. Uh, it struggled with the targets low. It struggled with the targets high, right? So it's got like this relatively narrow band around the northern part of the sky where where it's the sweet spot for the scope. And, you know, otherwise it struggles. Yeah, you could see it getting worse, right? So e either seeing conditions were getting worse. I don't think so because look at this deck, this deck pattern we have here. Uh, it's probably a combination of the target getting low. Yeah, you can see lots of dithers here. Uh, the software that I'm running, uh, Sequence Generator Pro, uh, you know, let me see if I have it in here. Yeah. Uh, so I can set a value to restart the capture. So if the guider distance, I have it set right now, is greater than 0.9 pixels, it will stop the capture, run a dither again, and resume. And so that's why you see so many dithers here, right? So it, it dithered, it tried to go, boom, and it just did that a whole bunch of times until it, uh, until it settled down enough. And yeah, that's pretty bad right there. Here's uh, another PhD log. This is from a different day. This is about a month later. Uh, you could see here that I ran it for an hour and then I had to stop it. And then we had a 10 minute, one minute, eight minute, and then 12 hours. What I suspect happened, I, I don't remember exactly, but what I suspect probably happened was it ran for an hour and it did pretty well, right? 1.24, again, I consider that a solid result for this AVX. Um, I mean, it don't look that great, but but it, it probably ran for about an hour, then hit the meridian flip 
and then you can see it, it kind of fell, ap fell apart after that. Uh, it may have tried a different target, but this is this is trying trying to get it to work. Yeah, see, 11.58, then 10 minutes after midnight, 14 minutes after midnight, and finally 24 minutes after midnight, I was able to get it going again. <laughs> so let's take a look at that one. And this looks pretty bad. And look, total is total 700. <laughs> That's awful, of course, but we can't. I can't blame this ridiculous number on the um, on the on the mount. You'll see what I mean. Let's scroll through this. So this ran for 12 hours. How could it even run for 12 hours? Is it, am I getting that much darkness? <laughs> well, so this chart's not looking good at all. Uh, I'll, I should go back and find out if I even kept the data from this. I mean, look at this dither. Look how long it. It dithered and it just completely went nuts here. Uh, right, so here's what happened though at the end of this run. There we go. <laughs> so what I suspect happened here, PhD, it's supposed to, um, when if it loses a star, it's supposed to uh, abort the, um, the sequence but then it has the ability to restart. So I have it set to recheck settings and try to restart the, the um, uh, sequence like every 10 minutes or something. This, this is how PHD handles clouds and stuff like that really well. If clouds roll in and you got 20 minutes of clouds and it clears up after that, PHD will keep restarting and recentering the target until it can because the clouds have passed, which is nice. But this sometimes happens if uh, it, if the sun rises, <laughs> and I haven't uh, I forgot to put a uh, stop time on the sequence. It'll keep trying to work, and I suspect that's what happened here, because I mean it it how 12 hours this this must be in the morning that this happened. So anyway, this is why this number is so high. But even if we took this out, you could see that this is not great guiding here with all these redithers, so all these restarted frames definitely struggled this night. All right, so I showed a really good, what I would consider a really good night and a really not good night. All right, so with all that said, the AVX can produce some decent images. Uh, this picture that I've been using as a background in this uh, PowerPoint presentation is a starless version of the Cygnus loop. It's cropped, uh, but this is a picture that I captured with this mount, this AVX mount with that Ascar 65 PHQ. Uh, my previous video, if you're new to the channel, my previous video I show the processing workflow I use to process this image. So if you're interested in seeing how I did this, uh, check that video out. This is a two panel uh, mosaic. And uh, here's another recent picture. And again, I cropped it to fit it on this picture. Uh, but this is a SHO, right? The camera is a 295 mono. I'm using six uh, astronomic six nanometer HA03 and S2 filters. And these were 450 second exposures. And they're all round. The stars are round. The stars look pretty good. Uh, this scope produces some really nice stars. Uh, they're pretty tight and um, and you know they're flat across the whole field and um, because I'm having that mount because I'm having the capture software restart the uh, capture of an individual picture if the mount guides too poorly outside that uh, specified range it restarts that helps cut the cut down on the number of s exposures I have that have bad stars in them and I still inspect each exposure individually. So that's how I am able to get good round stars with this AVX. I'm having to toss like 30% of my uh, frames. Well, no, it's not that bad. It's probably closer to 15%, but it's because I have that uh, setting. So I'm still losing time uh, because if it gets two minutes into the uh, exposure and restarts, then, you know, that's lost time. Here's a couple other pictures. Uh, same scope with the AVX. This time, this is with the 
uh, ZWO ASI 530, 533MC, so a one-shot color camera with that square sensor. The uh, filter was just a uh, luminance filter. And we got the uh, Cygnus wall and the Rosette Nebula. And just to show that it can do a pretty good job on the moon, <laughs> here's a lunar shot. Uh, this was captured recording video. Same mount AVX, same telescope, that's 65 PHQ, and I believe this was the ASI 533MC. Noticed a bright little dot in the lower left corner, that's Mars. Alright, so what are my thoughts on this? Uh, I think it's a fantastic mount for visual use. I really do. Uh, the mount was designed, in my opinion, for visual, not for astral photography. And it excels at that. It, uh, it works really well. You know, I have for astrophotography, I really need to clarify that and say for deep sky astrophotography. I would say no, I can't recommend this mount. I think it's fine if you're just going to do solar imaging or image the planets with an 8-inch telescope uh, like the Celestron Edge. Uh, then I think it'll do just fine on that. But for this deep sky astrophotography, I, I can't recommend it. I know a lot of people are looking at it. I was one of them because of the price and uh, and because of the Celestron name. And I know a lot of people have them. Uh, but uh, and, and it's possible. I showed you the pictures. It's possible some people out there are running even a Celestron Edge SCTs and on their AVXs and getting results from them. So it's not that you can't do it. Uh, it's just I think I think it's um, it's just not consistent and it, many people may find it very frustrating uh, to try to get usable data out of them. Now if if I were to tell if I could go back in time and tell myself in 2017 right before I hit the purchase button on that AVX I would have told myself you know what buddy save up for a few more months I know it's hard save up and get yourself an Atlas class mount instead. Now I think an HEQ5 or the Orion Sirius as as it's also known as I think those would be better options than the AVX. They're going to be more consistent even though I have no personal experience with an HEQ5 I know a lot of people that do run them and there's a lot of people out there that are running them and they are just they seem to be more consistent uh, performers than the AVX. Uh, users of those mounts don't seem to go through some of the hair pulling frustrations that you're going to run into with an AVX. I can tell you when I got my first EQ6 and I got that up and running it was like a breath of fresh air. All the stuff that I used to worry about and fight with the AVX was gone <laughs> with the with the EQ6. Uh, it used to be that you would pay a lot of money for a premium mount because a premium mount would just kind of fade away into the background, meaning you're not having to worry about the mount. You can focus on all the other stuff. Honestly, with these EQ6s, with the exception of a few rare occasions, those EQ6s are pretty much doing the same thing. And it's gotten to the point today with a lot of newer mounts, these harmonic drive mounts that are coming out seem to be really popular. And... Uh, you're not hearing too many people struggle with them. Not not with the way that I struggled in 2017 with my AVX. So I know it's hard. The AVX is on sale right now for just under a thousand bucks. So I mean that is a pretty good price. But I'd still recommend holding off and saving up a little bit more. And I don't know. I, I'm... I'm personally considering replacing my AVX with a ZWO AM3 for astrophotography. I do plan to keep that AVX uh, and make it a purely visual mount. But um, but for astrophotography, I think an AM3 would be a really nice alternative to an AVX. Uh, I mean, the whole mount weighs less than the counterweight <laughs> that you use on an AVX. And everything that I've seen from the guiding uh, on the AM3 and AM5, it, they basically look like they perform similar to an EQ6. So that's kind of what I'm thinking for myself. And, you know, I would tell anyone that's considering an AVX 
strictly for deep sky astrophotography to uh, look elsewhere and continue your research. All right, now a little shameless self-promotion here. I am an affiliate for a High Point Scientific. So if you, after watching this review, decide you still want to buy the AVX, uh, if you use the link that I'm going to put in the, um, in the description of this video and purchase your AVX from High Point Scientific, I'll get a little commission off of that. Uh, I'll also put a general link in there. So if you uh, watch this video and decide that uh, you want to get an Ioptron CEM120 instead of the AVX, uh, I'd get a little bit of a commission on that purchase too, <laughs> which would certainly help the channel out. I've got some big plans for the channel, but it's going to take some big money, so it might be a while before we get there. <laughs> All right, uh, please hit that like button on the video and if you're not already subscribed I'd really appreciate a subscription what you're going to get out of this channel the the bread and butter of my channel is mostly these processing workflow videos the goal is to post a video for just about every target I image showing my work through my workflow uh, there are also tutorials on the page and of course gear reviews so with that, clear skies and good evening.